Acts chapter 15, verse 36. Acts 15 and 36. In the old days, when it was time for the army to charge, they would hear the blast of a trumpet. And it's not difficult to see why. The idea was that the trumpet would sound across the whole battlefield. It would cut through whatever noises and distractions and would rouse the army to action. So when I was a kid, we used to watch westerns, and so this would happen all the time. You'd see the, the trumpet blast, and then here come these living and powerful soldiers coming to the rescue, the cavalry charge, the cavalry is returning, and you hear that trumpet echoing over the plain. And, and the second half of Acts, really the whole book of Acts, but as we re-enter this book, it, it is a trumpet blast for the church. That's really what it is. Martin Lloyd-Jones called Acts a tonic. Well, I don't take tonics, so that word is a little less meaningful for me, but I think what he means is it's an energizer. It's something that wakes you up. It's something that brings you health and vitality, and that's really what the book of Acts does in, in, in the second section of Acts that we're getting into, beginning in, in the end of chapter 15 and, and following the final 12 chapters of this book. It is this tonic, this trumpet blast that rouses the church. It is a, a packed 12 chapters. Just to list a few things that we are <laughs> going to be walking through over the next 12 chapters. There is obviously conversions. There is also a riot There is exorcism, there is imprisonment, and then liberation by divine earthquake. There is new church plants, there is a foiled assassination attempt, there is a shipwreck and a dramatic rescue, and most importantly, there is the planting of churches throughout the Mediterranean world as crowds and crowds of people come to know Jesus as Savior. And the reason we have this book and the second half of this book recorded for us is to rouse us to similar vigor and action and activity in the same kinds of activities. That like the early church, we would be roused to action. We would hear the the trumpet blast of Acts and we would want to charge ahead into our own gospel mission. So that's what is before us as we pick up this story. If you're new with us, uh, as a, a tender of this church, I would recommend you can go back and, and listen to the messages uh, for the first 15 chapters, and, and maybe that would catch you up as you anticipate the following. We're, we're picking up this story right after there has been this dramatic council of pastors and apostolic leaders in Jerusalem where they defined once and for all that salvation is by grace alone, that the Gentile believers did not need to keep or fulfill the law of Moses uh, in, the, in the Old Testament way, they did not need to be circumcised in order to be saved. And, and we pick up the story after Paul and Barnabas, along with uh, brothers and leaders, Silas and Judas, have come back from Jerusalem to Antioch, and they are sharing the news of that council. And they've been there for some time, and that's where we pick up the story in Acts 15, 36. Let's read this together. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return. And visit the brothers in every city where we proclaimed the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now, Barnabas wanted to take with them John, called Mark. But Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium, and Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. And he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. And they went on their way through the cities. They delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. Now, if you're like me, 
And if I was sitting out there, I would wonder, in what way are these two stories a part of the trumpet blast that you're just describing in the book of Acts? Because they certainly don't seem very trumpety. At least when I read them, they don't seem like a trumpet. They seem more like the ticking of administrative typewriters to describe a necessary issue that they had to deal with, and let's get on to the exciting stuff. That's what it seems like when you first read these stories. But I want to draw your attention to the conclusion of both of them. I want to draw your attention because, as you know, in Acts, Luke is a realist. Luke is not interested in a kind of optimism about the church, a a sort of hagiography that looks back and says everything was beautiful and they never had troubles. What he's interested in is describing the real world difficulties and challenges that were faced by the early church and then demonstrating how in spite of those challenges and sometimes through those challenges, God brought about the victory of the gospel and the strengthening and building of his church. That's Luke's intention. And so the the trumpet blast of Acts is is not the sound of a a little toy trumpet that's just optimistic about life. Yay, church. Everything was wonderful. That's not Acts. Acts describes life in the real world, and then it talks about a real God who overcomes or even works through those difficulties to bring about the building of his church such that the gates of hell cannot stand against it. So I want to draw your attention to the end, verse 41 and verse 5. We have this great difficulty described in the earlier verses, 36 through 40, and then Luke summarizes it by saying, He, Paul, went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. And then verse 5 of chapter 16. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers, listen to this, daily. They increased in numbers daily. So every day, regularly, on a daily basis, people are being added through conversion to these churches. As Paul speaks to them about the grace of God, people are daily being added to the numbers, and the churches are being strengthened. Now, what precedes those two summarizing verses would seem to be anything but exciting and exhilarating, wouldn't it? There's a big disagreement, and then Paul has to deal with these cultural prejudices with this poor young guy that just wants to help in gospel ministry. And yet at the end of the story, what do we find? Churches strengthened, people converted, people being added to their numbers daily. What do we get from that? Well, through the diligent efforts of gospel-centered ministry, God will strengthen his church. Through the diligent efforts of gospel-centered ministry, God will strengthen his church in spite of obstacles, in spite of difficulties, in spite of unexpected challenges and disillusioning disagreements. God will strengthen his church. God will advance his gospel. That's the message of Acts. And it's contained in a very succinct form in these two stories. So I just want to look at each story in turn and how does the result of God strengthening his church come about as Paul and Barnabas and Timothy persevere in gospel ministry. So the first story we have is about Paul and Barnabas. And I might say that what we learn from that is that gospel ministry is not crushed even by painful disagreement. Gospel ministry is not crushed even by painful disagreement. So let's look at this story. Paul wants to return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Uh, Just a a quick aside on this note. Uh, Paul does not consider churches to uh, be fine once they're planted. He wants them to be strengthened in the Lord. That's valuable for us as we think about our our missiology, our, our doctrine of missions. We don't believe as a church that merely planting a church, or even less, merely evangelizing an area is a sufficient commitment to a a gospel-centered biblical mission. We we want to follow Paul's example and be concerned for the well-being of those churches. So the way we practically bring this about is through our family of churches, Sovereign Grace churches, we support church planting, but we also support church care. 
Because we're trying to follow Paul's example, and, and you see that in the letters as well. Pa- Paul is just not merely concerned with planting churches. He wants them strengthened, guarded, protected, growing in maturity. So we, we want to do that as well. So we support both church planters and church caregivers, if I can use that phrase. Regional leaders and sort of pastoral counselors that are available in different regions for our family of churches. That, that's one way we, we try to apply this, that Paul's concern, he does this over and over, is not only to plant, but to plant and return, to plant and establish, to plant and guard, to check on their well-being. I think that should be our heart as well. And as a church plant, now some four and a half years ago, we need to take this seriously, that, that God intends for us not merely to be planted, but to continue to grow in strength. Valuable lesson to take from Paul's heart and Barnabas's heart to return and plant and, and, and benefit these church plants after they've already been established. But then we, we, we see the problem. Barnabas wants to take John called Mark. We know from elsewhere that this was his cousin. This young guy named Mark had accompanied them on an initial church planting mission, but he left them midway through. And now it comes out that Paul considered his departure from them to have been a sign of weakness or lack of commitment. These were obviously very strenuous journeys. They were facing life or death situations. The antagonism of the Jewish population was intense. And apparently, for whatever reason, this young man, Mark, had left them. And Paul thought it'd be very unwise, given they're going back into dangerous territory, facing again life or death situations. We'll read about that in the next couple chapters. Paul's not wrong. This is a very dangerous church planting mission. And, and he thinks we, we need to have people that we can count on being there the whole time. This is not wise. This young man is not prepared for this. Barnabas, as he was often called, is this man who is deeply encouraging and you can, you can just feel the different giftings at work here. Paul, the wise builder, is concerned about the wisdom of this young man. Is he mature enough for this? Barnabas says, let's give him another chance. Let's have faith. Maybe, maybe God will help him this time. Well, apparently, they cannot come to an agreement. Actually, the word there in verse 39 describes an intense disagreement, a sharp disagreement. They, they, they have a strong difference of opinion. This is, is not something that they are able to compromise over. They're either going to take Mark or not. They can't take Mark halfway. There is no halfway meeting point on this. He's either coming or he's not coming. And you can understand those kinds of disagreements are hard. There, there's, there's no way to, you know, this isn't like, well, well let's, let's take him and he'll come halfway. That's Paul's whole point. If he's coming, he needs to come the whole way with us. There's no easy way to compromise this. It either is one way or the other, and they cannot agree. Paul and Barnabas cannot agree. Now, now Luke, I read one commentator, he made a great point. He said, Luke, is, he, he will not hide the intensity of this disagreement. And, and we should feel, I think, the intensity of this for the early church. The, these are the hero church planters of the early This is Paul and Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas, the great encourager of the early church, he brought Paul into ministry. He sort of reconciled him with the Jerusalem elders. He encouraged him. He brought him into Antioch to join that pastoral team. He was his early cheerleader in ministry. Paul, the great planter of all these churches and the the apostle to the Gentiles, and, and they cannot come to the same opinion. They cannot agree. Neither one of them will yield their opinion about what is best in this situation. It's eye opening. It's surprising. It's potentially embarrassing, which I think is precisely why Luke puts it in. Because Acts is simply not a pasted over version of the early church. I have found over the years great comfort in this paragraph. Great comfort in this paragraph. Because gospel ministry is not crushed even by painful disagreement. Now, Luke does not give, you notice he's very careful, he does not assign sinful motives to either of these men. Doesn't mean they didn't sin in the situation. He just says, look, the essence of the disagreement was not a sinful one. It doesn't, at least as Luke describes it. It was a difference of opinion. 
It was a, a question of wisdom, what's best and what's foolish. It was a question of wisdom. He, he doesn't seem to condemn one in favor of the other. We, we don't get the sense that, that Barnabas was denounced by the church in any way. We don't get the sense that even Paul and Barnabas denounced each other's ministries in any way. We just get the sense because of the strength of the disagreement, they ultimately came to the place where they said, we, we simply are unable to work together. We have to do one or the other. So the only way we can figure this out is for your ministry to be separated from my ministry. It's uncomfortable, isn't it? It's an uncomfortable thing. This is Paul and Barnabas. This is the power team. And they they can't come to an agreement, so they separate. Barnabas takes Mark and goes away to Cyprus. Paul chooses Silas, one of the brothers from Jerusalem, and departs overland uh, up towards Syria and Cilicia. What are we supposed to get out of this? Well, I think... A major thing we're supposed to get is that point, that gospel, diligent gospel ministry is not crushed, it's not decimated, it's not obliterated, even by painful disagreement. There are times when genuine, mature, godly, wise Christians have disagreements of wisdom. Even disagreements to such a degree that they are unable to work together in exactly the same field of ministry. Now, obviously, I could preach a hundred messages on the importance of reconciliation where there is sin, all right? So this in no way mitigates our calling as Christians to forgive one another, to love one another, to care for one another, to compromise wherever we can, to be flexible, to be humble, to be the servant of all, to consider others more important than ourselves. I mean, there would be a hundred messages on that, right? And yet there is this paragraph that, that needs to be present in our thinking about our Christian life and the gospel ministry as well. Paul and Barnabas found it to be the case that they were going to have to be fruitful in different fields. Now, I find sometimes in my own heart that I, I, I don't want to accept this as a possibility. And so I either despair of any fruitfulness where there is disagreement or I decide that any disagreement must be the occasion of sin. And so we're going to stay here and figure this out until Paul, you will repent of worry, and Barnabas, you will repent of foolishness and flattery. But that doesn't seem to be what they did. We we should, I think, have every expectation, knowing who Paul is, knowing who Barnabas is, that if there was sin, there was reconciliation relationally there. And yet the difference of opinion remained and they felt like it seems as though since the gospel ministry is not to be crushed by this disagreement, it seems a separation is the most valuable thing we can do. I remember a number of years ago hearing that that two people who I, I greatly respected, greatly, greatly, greatly respected, were in a severe disagreement, sharp disagreement. And I, I remember thinking, is that possible? Is that possible for people to have a severe disagreement? Well, this passage helps us with this. Apparently, yes. Apparently, it is. And apparently, the gospel can still go forward, even in that situation. There doesn't need to be disillusionment. There doesn't mean to be bitterness and, and rage and gossip and slander. You don't get any sense that the church in Antioch was split over this or all of the churches in Galatia were split over this or people began to choose sides. I'm for Paul. I'm for Barnabas. Yay for wisdom. Yay for encouragement. You don't get any sense of that. You, you get the sense that the brothers said, well, this is confusing, but we're just going to keep plugging away. I, I guess you should go work over here and you go work over here and, and we love each other more from a distance, apparently. <laughs> There, there is something of an antidote to the disillusionment of differences of opinion in this category. Now, again, in the ordinary, everyday life of the church, should there be countless ways where there is compromise and laying down our preferences for others and, and deferring to another person's wisdom? Of course there should be. But, but are there moments where difference of opinion is so severe that this could be the result in a certain situation? Well, well, sure. Sure, there could be. And when that moment comes, 
Despite every effort, despite every attempt, despite examining your own heart, make sure sin is not involved, despite everything you seek to do, there needs to be a, a gracious, continued diligence in gospel ministry rather than a derailing into disillusionment and bitterness. You, you, you can see those being the two choices, can't you? In that moment, well, I, 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 if, if, if I can't get along, I, I don't want to do anything. I'm going home. And, and sadly, I, I've known Christians where that was their reaction. They experience in someone else or in themselves some kind of sharp disagreement over opinions. And, and what do they do? I, I've had it with this. It's ridiculous. If I can't be on the same page, I'm not being on any page. I'm turning the page. And, and yet there is a something here of God reminding all of us that the gospel mission, serving the Lord, is so important that even in this moment, they persevere. Barnabas goes to Cyprus, presumably to keep preaching and caring and serving the churches that were there. Paul goes, and then here's the divine stamp. He strengthened the churches. He was commended by the grace of God, and he strengthened the churches. The mysteriousness of this, why aren't Paul and Barnabas supposed to be working together? We don't know, Lord. We leave it into your ministry, and he's commended by the grace of God, and then they just keep preaching the gospel and keep serving. And if I could say anything to Christians who've experienced a, a tough disagreement, either in their local church or watching some extra local leader, I would say, look, look, follow their example. Y yes, maybe there has to be decisions made, and maybe there has to be different fields of ministry in the future, maybe so, but, but don't give in to self-pity and disillusionment and go home and sit and pout about it. Just keep on serving the Lord. Keep following the path of gospel diligence, and the Lord will strengthen his church just like he did with Paul. Is it confusing? Of course it's confusing. Is it unexplainable? Of course it is. Is it a mystery that God will explain one day? Of course it is. I don't know why Barnabas was supposed to go to Cyprus and Paul's supposed to go over to the mountain country. Who knows? God knows. What I do know is that following their example is going to lead to God strengthening his church. And self-pity and disillusionment never leads to anything good. It's a valuable chapter for us. So it's, it's very valuable for us. In the midst of this triumphant book, there's this realistic depiction of these two great leaders who simply cannot come to an agreement and yet must persevere in gospel diligence. And the result of their perseverance is that the Lord strengthens the churches. Very valuable. The gospel is stronger than even painful disagreement. It is not crushed by it. The churches are still strengthened. Second thing I think we learn in this second part of the chapter, the gospel and gospel ministry, gospel diligence, it is shaped by a gospel priority. It's shaped by a gospel priority. So Paul goes overland. He's returning to the same areas. He goes to Derby and Lystra, and it says a disciple was there named Timothy. Now, what an introduction this is, and, and, and what a, a gift to Paul. You can only imagine that Paul and Barnabas, for that matter, are greatly grieved by what's just happened. Now, why, why couldn't we figure this out? This is confusing. I don't know. This is, I don't know why we couldn't figure that out. And then here Paul comes, and the first thing he discovers when he gets to Lystra and Derby is that there is a young disciple, probably the fruit of his early ministry in this area, who is now grown in stature and is well spoken of by all the believers and apparently is willing to now accompany Paul. And what an introduction. Timothy is referenced again and again and again in the New Testament. He is called Paul's son in the faith. He is assigned by Paul. He enters pastoral ministry eventually. He's assigned by Paul as a pastor in various places. He's commissioned by Paul to go and, and serve places where Paul can't be there. So this young man is, is just now being introduced to us in scripture. He will eventually become a giant of the faith. He, he's, he's one of two men that we have letters from Paul to in the New Testament. Where, where, and Paul specifically says to Timothy that he is entrusting the deposit of gospel ministry to him. That as he's facing the end of his life, he's trusting Timothy to carry on the work. So it's, it's, it's a wonderfully exciting introduction when Paul meets Timothy here in, in Derby and, and Lystra. And, and yet there is a problem. Timothy is the son of a Jewish mother. His father was a Greek. He's well spoken of by all the brothers, but the assumption, the assumption is, 
of his father being a Greek is that Timothy would not have been circumcised because his father would have objected. That's a Jewish practice back then, not a Greek practice. And so Paul does something contextually shocking. Paul wants Timothy in verse 3 to accompany him, so he takes him and circumcises him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Then having done this, he takes Timothy on their way, and they deliver to them for observance the decisions that had been reached in Jerusalem. Now, this is a, a shocking juxtaposition of things. The decision that was reached in Jerusalem was that circumcision was not necessary for salvation. Paul does this to Timothy to take him to deliver this decision that what he's doing for Timothy is not necessary for salvation. Very surprising. Here's how I think we can put this together. Because Timothy was a Jew, there was not a, a question, apparently, in the context or in Paul's mind about whether he needed this for salvation. Because we see elsewhere in Galatians and when Paul talks about Titus, for example, when that is the issue, Paul steadfastly and courageously refuses to submit to that requirement as a requirement for salvation. But in this case... Paul wants Timothy to help him evangelize these Jewish synagogues. Paul almost always starts in the Jewish synagogue with his evangelization of a city. And he knows, look, if they know that his father's a Greek and he's not circumcised, I don't know how they like, introduced this to new people, but somehow, uh, <laughs> somehow he's afraid that this word would get out and the synagogues would be aware of this and that they would be culturally disinclined to welcome Timothy as a Jew into the synagogue. Or if they did welcome him in, they would look at him as some kind of imperfect Jew. Now we know, because of what Paul teaches elsewhere, that Timothy already lacks nothing in his standing in Christ Jesus. But because of Paul's commitment to the gospel, and more importantly because of Timothy's commitment to the gospel... The desire is to do anything that will help them preach the gospel to their Jewish brothers in the various cities in the Mediterranean. So how do we think about this? It's shaped, the gospel ministry that God will use to strengthen the church, it's shaped by gospel priority. What that means is that whatever can be done for the sake of gaining gospel access as long as it is not contrary to God's word, should be done. Whatever can be done by way of personal sacrifice for the sake of gaining gospel access for evangelism should be done. So the priority of the gospel shapes Paul and Timothy such that they are willing to sacrifice even their freedoms for the sake of gaining access for the gospel. Paul does not want Timothy's background to be a distraction when he strolls into a synagogue to preach. He doesn't want them thinking about Timothy, even if that's based on their old cultural assumptions and their wrong view of the coming Messiah and their unfulfilled sense of the law. He doesn't want even that distraction to keep them from listening to Timothy talk about Jesus Christ. So he says, Timothy, here's what I think we should do. I think if we have this done, it will eliminate a distraction from their minds and we can just preach the gospel freely without this being an issue. Timothy apparently is so eager that he allows this to take place. And then they go on their way through the cities and they deliver for them the observance of the decisions, namely that they do not have to be circumcised, that had been reached by the elders and the apostles who were in Jerusalem. And what's the result? The churches were strengthened in the faith and they increased in numbers daily. So what do we take from this? The gospel that frees us from the law also compels us to sacrifice ourselves for its sake. The gospel priority that will result in the strengthening of the church and the advance of the gospel, it shapes us personally by way of personal sacrifice, and it compels us to a courageous defense of its doctrine. And Paul does both at the same time with no hesitation. You see the difference? When it comes to our behavior and our willingness to evangelize, Paul will take any action to sacrifice to labor for the, the evangelization of the Greek world and the Jewish world. 
But when it comes to the doctrine of the gospel, he will courageously defend the freeness of grace. And he will refuse to allow it to be muddled with by some inclusion of law keeping. The gospel has so shaped Paul that he is, he's willing to sacrifice anything to allow it to gain access, and yet he will not sacrifice its doctrine because that's the very thing he wants to deliver. He's stalwart in doctrine. He is flexible in his personal rights and privileges. I think this passage seems to be an example of what Paul writes about in 1 Corinthians. He says, Though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew. That that seems to be precisely what he's asking Timothy to do. To the Jews, I became as a Jew. In order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became. I became, in other words, I acted as one under the law. Though not being myself under the law, so this is not a divine obligation, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. And at the same time, You have Paul, the lion defender of salvation by grace alone, delivering that decision to the apostles and elders, or to the churches from the apostles and elders in Jerusalem. So what type of gospel ministry will result in a strengthened church and the advance of God's mission? A gospel ministry that is not crushed by painful disagreement and is shaped by the gospel itself. That's the kind of ministry that God will use to strengthen the church. It's not crushed by personal disagreement. It keeps persevering. It is shaped personally. It will sacrifice anything for the sake of getting the word to the lost. And yet it will defend the true nature of that gospel as being by grace alone, faith alone, in Christ alone, to the death. That's the gospel ministry that God will use to strengthen his church and to advance his mission around the world. That's the gospel ministry that's described in these two packed paragraphs, and that's the kind of ministry that God calls us to as a local church. It is not quickly crushed by relational disagreements or any kind of disappointments. It allows our lifestyle, our rights, our preferences to be sacrificed for the sake of evangelizing those around us, and yet it is steadfast and courageous in defending and delivering the true news of the gospel of grace alone. And as I thought about those three categories, I thought, what, what, a, what a, a wonderful framework of what I believe God wants to do in us as we continue to study Acts. As we think about our lives, what a, what a wonderful framework for us. Let, let, me, let me put it in terms of, of three questions to conclude. Where can we persevere in gospel ministry in spite of relational disappointment? Where can we persevere in serving the Lord, in preaching the gospel, and sharing the gospel in spite of relational disappointment? Oh gosh, this is, this is applicable in, in, in small groups and when somebody is offensive, even up to the point where you, you simply reach a, a sharp disagreement with someone, when you're experiencing relational disagreement with a, a friend or a sibling or a child or a spouse, and that not distract you from throwing yourself into the work of the Lord. Isn't that applicable all over our lives, that that relational disagreement? It just draws us away from loving the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. I can't do that right now because I have this terrible relationship issue, and it's just so hard, and you don't know my my spouse. I mean, they are just such a burden to me, and and my children are hard, and 
can you see how you just kind of wallow in relational disagreement? And think, well, I, I, boy, that, do, do you know what I have to deal with? And this person, my care group, and they just constantly want me to bring the snacks, and they never bring the snacks, and I have to pay for all the snacks, and, and, and I can't do this anymore. I've hosted nine times. They never hosted anything, and, and, and sometimes I even give them rides. They never give me a ride, and, and I'm just going to stay home. Relational disagreement, it's like a swamp. It just pulls you in. Okay, well, yeah, I, I really can't do anything for the Lord today because of this drain. And Paul and Barnabas, what are they doing? Wow, that was painful. That was hard. That's confusing. That's difficult. Can I have to have more conversations about that? And what do they do? Strengthening the churches. Where can we persevere in, in gospel ministry? We're not apostles. We're not all called to travel the world, but, but we, we all have ways where we're serving the Lord and we're representing his gospel in our families, our small groups, our community, our life. We can't let relational disappointment drag us away from that calling. Think about that opportunity this year. This year there's going to be lots of opportunities to persevere through relational difficulty. Lots of opportunities. I'll disappoint you. Probably your, your community group leader will disappoint you. Probably somebody else will disappoint you. Your spouse will. Your children will. And in those moments, can we persevere? Great, great, great vision for our year ahead of us when we face these kinds of moments. Second question. Where are there personal sacrifices you and I can make for the sake of evangelism? I severely doubt that there's anything we're going to be doing more sacrificial than what Timothy did. Seems highly unlikely. But we could sacrifice schedules, We could sacrifice free time. We could sacrifice reputation. I I was just talking with Aaron about this the other day. I I love Aaron's zeal and passion for this area. He's constantly talking about how he he isn't a good example in this area, and I'm constantly disagreeing with him. And, and, And he was telling me the other day, you know, it's so, so important for us to be willing to face the discomfort of starting conversations and friendships with those that don't know the Lord. It was like right after he's saying, I'm just so not good at this. And I was saying, bro, that's so true. Is it my right to walk into my house and not talk to my neighbor? Well, technically, yes. But is it my privilege to sacrifice that time? to build a relationship with them? Is, is it my right to not take my coworker out to lunch and have a conversation with them? About, well, of course it is. But is it our privilege to go ahead and do that? Oh, I, I just, I want to be like Timothy and Paul. I'm not like that. I'm consumed with what it's my right to do instead of what's my privilege to do. Brothers and sisters, we, we need to be more, I think, more like Aaron more like Paul and Timothy, I, I need to be. Where, where can I sacrifice rights and privileges for the sake of gaining a, an opportunity to speak about God to those that don't know him? And, and if you're here and you're not a believer in Jesus, I just want to say personally, thank you for coming. I, we, we really should come to you and share the good news. But here you, you've come to us. So if you're here and you don't believe in Jesus as God or Savior or anything, can, can I just tell you, Jesus Christ is the maker of this world, and he invites you to know him. And if you trust in him, he'll forgive all of your sins and give you the promise of eternal life with him forever. That's the good news. And so we here as members of the church, we believe that. And that's why we sing about him and talk about him. We want you to know him. And whatever sins you've committed, no matter what your background is, if you believe in Jesus, you can know him today as Savior and Lord. And and Christians, we need to sacrifice, like Timothy, like Paul, for the sake of sharing that news with those. Maybe some of you are here, those that are in your neighborhood, friends, relatives, cousins, grandma, aunts, uncles, dad, children. And we want to believe that as we do that, God will strengthen his church and he will add to their numbers those who are being saved. Final question. 
Where can we courageously defend gospel doctrine? Where can we courageously defend gospel doctrine? That's what they're doing. When they delivered this decision, Paul is courageously defending gospel doctrine. Just a simple way I think we can begin to do that is by reading gospel doctrine. If, if, we, if we're not reading about the gospel and studying it, then we're not going to be able to defend it. We won't even discern where it's being uh, undone by false teaching. <laughs> Paul was able to discern when those brothers came from Judea and they're teaching the brothers about this thing they should be doing in order to be real Christians. Paul's able to discern the danger. And stand up against it. Brothers and sisters, all of us should be reading in such a way that we can discern doctrinal dangers in our own hearts and those around us as well. Let me encourage you, be reading gospel-centered books. There's a number of them. Cross of Christ by John Stott. Christ Our Mediator by C.J. Mahaney. What is the Gospel by Greg Gilbert. There's, there's many books by Jerry Bridges, Transforming Grace, or The Gospel for Real Life, just to get you started. But we need to be reading and studying this doctrine so that we can defend gospel doctrine as well. That's the only gospel that saves people. That's the only gospel that there is that can rescue people from sin to, to righteousness and, and holiness before God. That's, it's the only gospel that can bring people hope of eternal life. That's the only gospel that can increase numbers of conversions daily. When we read these two little stories, I mean, there's two little stories in the book of Acts, but man, they are, they are packed with themes for us to consider as we look ahead to our year and consider, how, Lord, how can we be this way? How can we persevere in relational difficulties for the sake of you strengthening your church and you spreading your gospel? How can we sacrifice for the sake of evangelism? How can we defend and learn better and know and hold on to the gospel doctrine that is the center and the, the cornerstone of who we are as Christians? Christians and who we are as a church. How can we do those things? I think the book of Acts is going to help us do those things. As we study it in the coming months and look at story after story, it's going to hit at those themes. Perseverance through relational difficulties and all kinds of difficulties. The emphasis on sharing the gospel and getting out of our comfortable lives so that we can speak God's word to those who need to hear it. And most importantly, fixing our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ and the perfect finished work of his salvation for sinners. This book is going to help us do those things and build them into our lives. And as we do that, what happened to them will happen to us. The Lord will strengthen this church and will use us to reach this community with his gospel. Let's pray. Lord, I want to ask you, as we, as we study this next few months, the final 12 chapters of Acts, I pray that the trumpet of your voice would rouse us to action. Lord, I, I pray that the trumpet of your word would, would call us to charge ahead into perseverance in your kingdom and usefulness for you, in bringing you glory and speaking your word and loving the good news of your salvation by grace alone. Lord, Lord, wake up our hearts, Lord. Wake them up, Lord. We are, we are prone to slumber and prone to wander. But Lord, we pray that you would tune our hearts to sing your praise, to love your gospel, to speak your word, to sacrifice for the sake of your mission. Lord, do this among us, Lord. Speak, Lord, and let us hear. Shout to us and let us rise up. Transform us, Lord, and let us be used for your glory. And let us see the strengthening of your church and the addition of people saved by your grace into our numbers. We pray this in the name of Jesus and trusting you. Amen.